So in France, infringement of intellectual property rights is actually called counterfeiting. Whether it's intentional or non-intentional, everything, or almost everything, is referred to as being counterfeiting, which I don't know what you think, but um, as far as I'm concerned, thinks is a very judgment, judgmental term. But it is deemed to be counterfeiting. So that being clarified, um, where do you enforce your intellectual property rights in France? Well, um, there are nine... Uh, well, first, it needs to be... The action needs to be brought um, in front of the Tribunal de Grande Instance, so TGI. Um, and uh, there are nine TGI in France which are competent for, uh, to try IP-related <coughs> um, cases. Uh, Paris, of course, but also Lyon. Uh, probably Bordeaux, Marseille, etc. Et <coughs> in relation to um, uh, patent uh, litigation matters, as well as infringement matters which relate to community registered trademarks and community registered designs, only the Paris TG is competent. Can we talk to me? Thank you so much. Uh, there are some interim remedies as well as permanent remedies available to uh, right owners. And, um, okay, so the strategy in France, because we do not have a discovery process, the French, it just doesn't fit with the French mentality, you know, it would be just like shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, you keep more information to be on our side, are you crazy? So, <laughs> you know, discovery, like in the US, forget it, it won't work in France, it's just not in our DNA. So, um, before you shoot, you need to aim. So what do you do? You've got um, three things that you need to do before you're actually alert the other side, but actually you've got a problem with them, or you actually uh, find a lawsuit. First thing is that you need to yes efficiently with your client. Um, you need to ask him or uh, her to provide all evidence of the um, IP rights. So the registration of the trademark, of the designs, of the patents, um, any evidence of uh, the copyright. So in French we've got this uh, system, which is uh, like this process, which is called enveloppe solo, whereby you can actually send to a French intellectual property registration office, the INP, an envelope in which um, you basically put some evidence that um, as of today's date, I have created this, uh, this, this work which is uh, protected by copyright. This is a way to prove that you've got uh, copyright on that. So um, also what you recommend to your client is to go into the shop where the infringing products are sold, uh, not say the word, just buy the infringing product, of course if it's affordable, and keep a receipt of the infringing product, the brochure about the infringing product, don't make a scene, uh, don't say anything, and then come back to me with all that stuff. Because we would need it for the, the court case. Um, also. The other um, process that is very often used in France is the support from a bailiff. So I know, in the UK, bailiff is the guy who actually comes um, at uh, someone's door um, who is a debtor and just bangs on the door, uh, come with the police and comes and just take over stuff. Well, in France, huissier uh, de justice, so the uh, French translation of bailiff, is, uh, is, is a term which um, um, refers to a, an officier de justice, so a, a sort of legal officer, uh, who, among other things, uh, can um, draft some um, act authentic, so what would be translated as an authenticated deed, that holds a, uh, the strongest degree of proof in front of a French court. And one of these authenticated deeds are uh, the procès verbal de constat d'huissier de justice sur internet. So let me translate that to you. So it's like an official report from a bailiff, a French bailiff, um, uh, that, uh, 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 reporting, setting out what is actually seen on the internet with pictures and all, and all that. And so this official statement is very useful whenever um, the infringing products or services are being offered online, which in those days it happens all, almost all the time. So before you actually uh, do anything, you ask this huissier de justice to prepare that um, statement, that procès verbal de constat du huissier de justice in, uh, de procès verbal de constat du huissier de justice sur internet. In fact, last week I did that on Tuesday. So um, I had this um, guy who is an artist here in uh, uh, London who calls me on Monday and he says, "Oh, there's a, an infringing artwork which is being sold at auction and we need to stop that auction." Okay. Uh, when is the auction? It's on Wednesday, so one day and a half, at 7 p.m. <laughs> and so um, we rushed with the Vicier Justice, so I took the best in the Paris market, 
Um, and, um, and we rush with your receipt of justice to actually prepare that procès verbal, the constant receipt of justice on internet, because obviously the first thing that an infringer would do when you send uh, uh, cease and desist that is that they would remove the stuff from the internet. So we uh, did that uh, uh, procès verbal, the constant receipt of justice on internet, first. And um, secondly, we prepared also to um, undertake a uh, saisie contrefaçon, so what Jane referred to as a search order, as it is called here. Le, la saisie de contrefaçon, so the saisie de contrefaçon, is a, an, an interim injunction. Oh, an interim remedy, but it, 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 is, it is, sorry, an interim remedy that is granted by a, uh, the court. So, coming back to my story about this uh, London artist who crazily calls me on a, on a Monday afternoon saying that we've got to stop that auction on, 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 uh, on Wednesday at 7 p before 7 p.m., I actually prepared all the documents so it's very bureaucratic. You've got to prepare the, uh, the uh, order, you've, it's a, well, the request to get the order, you've got to prepare the order. I had obviously to translate the uh, season disease letter that I had also prepared um, in, in French and English, la la la. And uh, then I go to the, um, to the Paris TGI uh, at 2 p.m. like a flower and I say, ah, I want to have the right to, uh, I want to have the order to actually go tonight in two, 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 two hours' time. Uh, to the auction place so that we can do a saisie contrefaçon. And they've been really cool about it, seriously. Usually, um, at the Paris TG, those saisie contre the orders for the saisie contrefaçon is going to be between 12, uh, no, sorry, 11.30 uh, p.m. and 12.30 uh, p.m. every day. And I arrive at 2 p.m. And so, of course, they called in May, but then they understood that I had been called by this person on Monday, la la la, and they actually granted it. It took an hour for the judge to say, yeah, but are you really sure that these are always related by copyright? So I explained everything I had to explain. At last, I got the, um, the, the order to, to, to do that search order, the saisie contrefaçon, and she said, yeah, well, it's um, 15 past 4 right now, and you must start that saisie contrefaçon before 5.30. So I rush with my taxi, and I go to the um, Receive Justice. Uh, she grabs her... her, her all our papers, she got plenty of papers, as well as a, uh, a, a, a laptop and a, a camera, and we go to the, to the auction, she said, no, you can't come in, because she can't come in with the, um, the client, and she cannot co come in into the, uh, the place where the CC controversy is going to happen with the solicitor, the lawyer. So I said, fine, I'll stay out. And, and, and um, at, I think, uh, 5.15, she gave them, she handed over the season this letter that I had prepared for these people to remove a lot from auction. And t eight minutes later, she starts doing a saisie contrefaçon. So we made it. We made it just about, but we made it. So just to summarize, um, cooperation from the client, uh, get this procès verbal de conseil de justice, essential, because we don't have a discovery process. And also, if possible, as in this case that I just um, spoke, spoke about, do the saisie contrefaçon. And of course, I mean, when the uh, auctioneer got some, the certain disease, and disease, um, like formally handed over by a huissier de justice, plus also the saisie contrefaçon, the search order, they were like, oh, of course you remove a lot from auction. And it was about, uh, the starting price was 70 grand. So anyway, my client was happy. But one thing about the saisie contrefaçon is that within 21 um, business days or 30, sorry, 20 business days or 31 days, you must file a, um, a lawsuit with the, Paris, the, the TG. Otherwise, the um, uh, saisie contrefaçon could actually be cancelled. So, yeah, just coming back on the cease and desist. Um, so there is the letter before court action in England and Wales. There, there is no obligation to, but a strong incentive in Germany to actually send a cease and desist. Hey, in France it's cool, guys. You don't have to do anything. I mean, I worked on a case last year where um, this um, New York-based fashion trend uh, setter uh, report agency, so they're basically like agencies that report on, on fashion trends and they issue some reports, uh, calls me from New York and says, yeah, I've just received this uh, summons from, uh, from uh, uh, the, the biggest uh, trade show, in, like fashion trade show in the world, but which coincidentally is based in France. And I said, did you get any warning, any notice? No, no, it's just arrived uh, through a, a, a New York-based bailiff uh, on, on, on my desk uh, in 13th of July 2013, if I remember, something like that. I said, okay, fine, and so what do we ask? Well, we just ask for 8 million euros damages. 
fucking crazy. Excuse my French. This is crazy. This is crazy. My client was like, <laughs> totally panicking. I come back to you know what this sort of crazy litigation cases, go, I mean, um, create. They really, they, this is a bullying case. You know, so how to monetize your intellectual property rights? In, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's come back to that in a second. So, no obligation to send a cease and desist. Uh, no obligation to attempt to settle the matter beforehand. Okay, the judge doesn't care. You, you don't have to have any, uh, you know, uh, um, you don't have any necessity to try to mitigate your losses or, or, or settle. And there's no obligation to make a deposit. It almost doesn't cost, actually, it doesn't cost anything to uh, start a litigation process apart from the lawyer's fees. You know, if, I mean, I think uh, to actually go and, and at a court hearing, I must pay 16 euros. So in terms of the final remedies, of course, damages, which have a very important punitive element. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details, but basically with the way damages are being uh, assessed by the judges, and sometimes, you know, it really is like a, 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 a poker. I mean, you don't know what's going to come out. So lots of... Uh, um, uh, alleged infringers are, are really scared about the way the French courts and French TGE assess the damages, but they usually try to do it in a, in a, in a rational way by looking at the negative um, economical consequences of a rights infringement, um, in particular the manque à gagner, so the uh, loss that the um, right owner has made because of this infringement, and also um, um, also, the, um, the, um, the, the loss that he would have made on, on, on potential income if uh, such infringement had not happened. There's also the moral prejudice suffered by the infringing, the infringing party, which is going into this, uh, this level, the assessment of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, damages, and also the income generated by the counterfeiter, including the savings of intellectual property investments, material investments, and marketing investments that the counterfeiter has derived from the infringement. It's bonus time. I mean, seriously, this is such a great way to monetize your, 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 your intellectual property rights as soon as you've got a semi, uh, um, so, you know, some, some semi allegations of, uh, of, intellectual, of infringement of intellectual property rights. Um, it is possible for a, for a French DG to also assess the, uh, the damages on a flat fee basis, a, a forfait, as in a, a, a sort of package, and that is usually um, valued as the amount of royalties that would have been paid should the infringer had asked prior authorization from the right owner to, uh, to, to use these uh, intellectual property rights. And that flat fee can usually also encompasses the moral prejudice suffered uh, by, the, uh, by the victim. So in France, the damages granted to victims of counterfeiters um, are very substantial um, because they have a punitive element and are correlated to the income earned by the counterfeiters. Um, I mean, to conclude very quickly, you know, just uh, forum shopping is the way today. As long as the uh, uh, products are put on the internet, it means that potentially you can sue wherever you want in the world. So, for example, a company um, that uh, produces in England and sells some garments over the internet to clients based in France, Italy, or the US um, and could be sued in England, um, France, Italy, or the US. So, why not select the best? Uh, uh, jurisdiction that is most favorable to IP right owners. And I can guarantee you that France is definitely uh, on this list. So <coughs> who do you sue? Um, I think one of the speakers earlier has mentioned that it's possible to, um, to sue the, uh, the luxury brand, but also sometimes the shop that sells the luxury items, uh, but also the distributors, the, the, the wholesale clients of uh, the luxury brand, uh, the stockists. <laughs> you can really sue a lot of people in the chain supply chain. And that, as Holger mentioned before, can put a lot of pressure on the actual infringer because of obviously what the, um, <coughs> what the sued party is going to do is turn back to the infringer who, uh, that is one of uh, their clients or their suppliers and say, oh, what's happening here? Can you, we, we're going to actually use the clause under the distribution agreement, uh, which is that you have to hold us harmless and, and indemnify us in case we get sued. So it can be really like a, a sort of domino uh, where you, you, you are sued as the uh, infringer, but also your client is sued, so therefore they're going to sue you too. And, and, and it can really be um, uh, very, very stressful for, uh, for an infringer or an alleged infringer uh, that they are sued, uh, because they could really end up with a lot of lawsuits. Costs. Um, I'd say that at least 50,000 euros um, is, is more or less the, uh, the budget on, the, 
on a, uh, for, for a legal cost when it's uh, a seriously fully fledged um, trademark copyright and uh, uh, infringement case with a, with a Paris TG, I would say, um, if it goes to the judgment stage. And sometimes in patent cases, it must be, it must be much more. Um, during this process of back and forth statements of defense or conclusion of defense and summons, the assignation, uh, the parties that can decide that it is just better to sit down around the table and endeavor to settle. So coming back to my case about this uh, New York-based fashion trade agency that got sued for 8 million euros of damages because they actually uh, published a report which was sold to seven people in the world um, about this fashion, um, fashion trade show which happened uh, last year in February. Um, you know, what did I do as the advisor of the counsel of one of the co-defendants? Well, I can't sue, obviously, and I asked for the um, cancellation of the trademarks. So there, when I did that, the uh, claimant started thinking, they are the biggest you know, fashion trade shows uh, in the world in their field, and now all their trademarks are uh, basically at risk, and we counted to them for 1.5 million euros. Ooh. So they summoned us uh, to actually attend a uh, potential settlement meeting in Paris two days before that meeting, may I say, so my client had to, flow to, 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 to fly from, uh, from New York, I had to come to London, and that's, that's how it started with that, um, that bitch uh, who barely spoke English. <laughs> um, so, are you ready to recognize that you have to infringe the copyrights and uh, trademark of our client? That was the opening line. Um, and both the co-defendant myself, sorry, the advisor of the co-defendant and myself, we said, well, we're not here to capitulate, we're here to actually settle, so that it is a win-win situation for, for all the parties involved. And then she asked that advisor, the counsel of the, um, of the trade show, uh, that uh, within that um, settlement agreement, uh, the co-defendants were recognized that they fully infringed the a trademark as well as copyright of the um, of a trade show, and that uh, settlement agreement would not be confidential, so it could be flagged and shown to every third party. And of course, there were some um, advertising um, requirements in the trade show. And on top of the settlement, which was for two hundred grand, um, she, the, this legal advisor, would take a fifty grand cut. I said to my client, uh, surely. Surely you do not want to settle on those, uh, on those, on, 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 on those, on those terms. Uh, surely, I mean, my advice is to definitely not settle on those, on those terms. And I think, look, our statement of defense is ready. We've got a court hearing in two weeks' time. Um, what do you think? And he goes um, with his New York-based, Israeli-born accent. Of course I'm going to settle. I don't even have a sexual life anymore because of this lawsuit. So he settled, I walked, I didn't advise him on that, and that is that. So, um, yeah, okay, well, uh, better say but sorry, um, in terms of trying to settle as much as you can, but um, be careful of, so mindful of the terms which are going to be included on the, uh, in the settlement agreement. Thank you very much.